I have a practice problem up there for you. Let's let Amber in. All right, take a minute. What do you think the product will be? You should probably also know the mechanism for this kind of reaction. This is an extension of something we did last class. What? Is the OH there to trick you? Uh, it's not there to trick you, but it's there to be used. So let's think about it. All right. What kind of reaction is this? What do you see as the reagents? It's oxymercuration, demercuration. Oxymercuration, demercuration, right? Now, the first thing that happens As we add the mercury, right? I'm going to sort of skip over where the electrons are going. All right. So now we come to where Sawyer's question is, is, you know, there's no OH. What are we supposed to do? Is there really no OH, though? Or is there an OH around somewhere? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> you can answer. What? I have the OH in the molecule. So we can have an intramolecular addition. Right? Where we actually have the OH from the molecule come in and attack it. So we can do that. All right. This comes actually from one of the homework problems in your book, just to be aware that the OH may come from an alcohol, might come from its own self. And then the sodium borohydride reduces that. an oxygen there. And you put the hydrogen on, right? Okay, so this would be a typical problem you would see on the exam or quiz or something. So be aware, intramolecular additions can happen. It's not just necessarily for alkoxymercuration, demercuration, halogenations. Think about what would happen if you had an alcohol around when you did a halogenation. A couple good practice problems in your book, so I would go ahead and do that. Any questions before we start? You look like you have a question. One, two, three, four. Oh, I made a mistake. And only one of you caught it. This should have been a five-member drink, right? Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. I added an extra one right there. My bad. <laughs> that better? Are we happy now? Always count your carbons. Oh, this one is still here. I just skipped a couple steps, so it would still be there, and then it would get picked up by another OH in there or something else that comes off the acetates. It just gets picked up. Sorry, the one in your book is actually a six-membered ring. Now, also remember, six- and five-membered rings are sort of the magic rings, so if you can make those, it's very stable and very happy to make them. So it probably won't happen to make a four-membered ring. Yep. Seven-membered rings are actually also not that stable, not that easy to make. Um, so for this class, just five and six are what we're going to focus on for the most part. There might be a practice problem in the book that shows a seven, but 
the reality is seven-membered rings are not very, not formed very easily. And there's a whole set of rules governing that, that if there's enough interest and you all want to take advanced mechanisms some year, I can offer that. No? It's fun. It's so much fun. Mechanisms all semester long. All right. So far we've talked about Markovnikov additions and anti-Markovnikov additions of HBr, but what if we wanted to do it to an alcohol, right? What if I wanted to make this? What if I wanted to get that OH in that least stable spot? How could I do that? All right, you might say, is this really a big deal? And the answer is, yes, it's a very big deal. A lot of the times in products that we're trying to make, the alcohols are not necessarily in the most easiest spot to put them. Such a big deal, in fact, that the person who figured out how to do this, any um, Purdue fans here? Yes, OK. This is Purdue's claim to fame in the chemistry world. Actually won a Nobel Prize. The chemist from Purdue won a Nobel Prize for this in 1979, H.C. Brown. Um, if you've ever been down there, the chemistry building's actually named after him. Right? And he figured out, I'll say 1979, figured out that if he used borane, B2H6, this would actually add and put the boron in the anti Markovnikov position. All right. And notice how the boron and the hydrogen are on the same side. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you do get that same side addition. And then if you used peroxide and OH minus, some sort of base, that would remove the boron and put an alcohol in its place. And it wouldn't just add to the bottom, it could also add to the top. So you would also get the enantiomer in this case. Did I just do that backwards again? I did. Man. CH3. There we go. Fixed. All right. Now, does anyone remember what we call addition on the same side? Did we talk about that yet? Did you read ahead? What do we call that? Anyone know? Okay, what is it if it's on opposite sides? Trans or anti, right? If it's on the same side, we call this sin addition. Okay. Yes, and it's S-Y-N. I know I'm not a good speller, but that is actually the way you spell it. All right, and that just means on the same side. So this adds in a sin fashion, not anti, so it's a little bit different than the things that we've studied, and it puts it on the other side. So what's going on? Well, a couple things. First of all, borane. Borane is an interesting molecule. Or in this case, this is diborane. And diborane is in equilibrium. With two BH3s. Right? And the BH3s are really the reactive agents here. Now, there is one problem with diborane. Right. It's what we call pyrophoric. 
Anyone have any guesses what pyrophoric might mean? It does. You expose it to air and it goes boom. Not necessarily the safest thing to use in the lab. All right. But we can actually make a reagent that is safe. If we mix borane with tetrahydrofuran, So this is tetrahydrofuran. It's an ether. It's a cyclic ether. And you add this to borane. You get two stabilized boranes. This is actually useful. We, it, you can buy it in a bottle. You can use it pretty safely. You don't have to worry about it blowing up. It's just a very nice stabilized version of borane. So when you see things, what you're probably going to see is something like this if it's over the reaction arrow because it's just easier to draw it that way. They're the same thing, THF borane is the reagent of choice. It's the reagent we actually use when we do these reactions. Is that a plus or a dot? Uh, it's a dot. Oh, okay. Because it's really sort of coordinated. So boron is an interesting element. It's actually my second favorite element for anyone that wanted to know. Boron is happy with only three bonds. Okay, It's right before carbon on the periodic table. So three bonds gives it a zero formal charge. However, it still has the same orbitals as carbon. So it actually is happy with three or four bonds. Once it has the fourth bond, though, it becomes negative. So it can stabilize things and is a really strong Lewis acid, kind of like aluminum. Aluminum is right below it. All right? And so it can use that sort of free vacant orbital to its advantage. And that's what goes on in the mechanism of this reaction. So let's take an example here. All right, let's say I react this with the borane. We'll say we'll do it in the THF complex. What happens? Well, boron, like I said, is a good Lewis acid. What is a Lewis acid? What's another name that we could call that? No. What's another name that we give? Positive charges, something that wants electrons. Electrophile. It's an electrophile, okay? It's a really strong electrophile. We have a pair of, or we have a pair of electrons in that double bond that really wants to give it up and feed into it. So my electrons and I set that up backwards. I am on a roll today. <laughs> there we go. All right. As the electrons are filling into the boron, the boron's going to get what? Negative or positively charged? Negatively, right? Because it's getting more electrons. So there'll be a positive fo charge forming on one of the carbons. That carbon is going to want electrons and is going to take it from one of the hydrides on the boron. All right, so what does that mean? That means this pair of electrons is going to drop down into the boron. We're forming a partial positive charge on that carbon. It's going to want a pair of electrons. It's going to take the pair of electrons from the hydrogen, right? From that hydrogen bond. It's going to say, I want this pair of electrons right here. And it's going to bring the hydrogen along with it. And that is why the hydride, the, it's actually a hydride getting added, an H minus, gets added to where the most po uh, partial positive charge would be. Which 
means that we have a hydrogen and a BH2. Does that make sense? So the boron is taking the electrons, is dropping off a hydride, an H minus, to where it fills in. And it all does this at the same time. So if it does it at the same time, it has to be in the same position, right? Think of it almost, I think of it almost as like a staple being added to something, the two prongs, right? They both have to add up at the same time, which means that if I have something flat right here, it goes onto the same side, right? And that's that syn addition that we get. They're on the same side. They're both on the bottom of that molecule. All right. Then the next step that happens is we add in our peroxide and OH minus. And we end up oxidizing. This is This is kind of an FYI mechanism, this half of it. I'm not going to test on the peroxide addition, but um, this gets deprotonated by the OH minus to give me the peroxide, deprotonated peroxide. That will actually add into the boron. Now remember, boron can have up to four bonds, right? So it's okay. And now we get an, uh, a rearrangement where this pair of electrons will actually slide over here and kick this off. And now the OH minus will come in, attach to the boron, kick that off. And we're almost there as I run out of space. And it kicks that group off. Now we have the O minus. And again, this stays on the same side. That rearrangement doesn't flip sides. Am I in the way? I can move. And then we have generated some water here, right? Right there. So it can actually pick up the hydrogen from my water. And we get our syn addition of the alcohol. Yeah, there is right here. That minus charge? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's my notes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, the, um, stoichiometrically, you can actually add one boron per three double bonds. So it'll actually add to. Each hydride can get shifted out, so you really need a one to three ratio. Uh, most of the time, you're going to make your bar, uh, BH3 not your limiting reagent anyway. So, all right. So, the big things to get out about this syn addition, you add some sort of boron agent followed by peroxide and OH minus, and you get the anti Markovnikov addition of the alcohol.
And no, it doesn't matter which order I put the THF and BH3 in. All right. Yes. So this essentially slides over because it's got the minus charge and kicks off this OH as a leaving group. Um, it's just energetically favorable with the boron. Yeah, it essentially just slides over but doesn't change its stereochemistry. It's kind of just like, but it kicks off the OH. That makes our boron neutral and gets rid of the minus charge. Okay. Let's put it to practice. What would I get with this? Ah, so my OH would come off of here. Mm -hmm. But what do I have to remember? What? What kind of addition? So how many products do I have? Two, right? What's the relationship between these? Diastereomers, yes. OK. So in the case of when you have some sort of stereochemistry way off yonder that's not being affected, and you do a reaction like this, you are going to end up getting diastereomers, because you're going to have it add to the bottom face and the top face. There's nothing saying one over the other, OK? So remember that. If this were to be an exam question, we would expect both of those answers. If you're missing one of them, you would lose points. And no one wants to lose points. So remember both of them. Yeah? Are these uh, basically 50-50 uh, uh, mix? It's going to be a 50-50 mix, yeah. OK. Well, <laughs> we'll say yes. <laughs> the reality is this is a six-membered ring that could be in a chair confirmation, and there could be one side that's easier to access than the other. But for your sake, yeah, 50-50. Okay. <laughs> yeah? That, like, goes on to it, just want to be on to the, like, like, the carbon with the least hydrogen to just build peroxide? It, it wants to be there because that's where you're forming. You're moving in H minus, right? Which means that we're moving. with a pair of electrons, right? Or hydro We're not doing an H plus this time. It's the hydride. That wants to attack where the most stable carbocation is going to be. So the most stable carbocation is going to form at that carbon right there, right? So that's where the hydride, the H minus, wants to move. I know it's a weird thing because we always think H plus is an acid. But here we're looking at the hydride, the H minus, as more of a nucleophile. And it's going to go to where the most stable carbocation is. Does that make sense? So that's why it wants to go there. All right, any questions on hydroboration? By the way, this shows up in your book after the Markovnikov edition of OH, so H3O+. Plus. It shows up right there in the book, so if you're wondering where it's at. Yes? 
Not necessarily. It could be enantiomers as well. So if I didn't have this stereo center right there, if that was just a hydrogen, then I would just get my two enantiomers. So you always end up with either enantiomers or the diastereomers, depending on, or it could be the same depending on the symmetry of the molecule. So you probably have one product. Was that supposed to have, would that be two? It would be, too. I was only showing the one side. It could have had attack from the top, too, yes. Going once, going twice. All right. We're now going to move on to what I like to call the potpourri of reactions with double bonds. Do you have a question, Micah? Hydroboration. The first reaction we're going to look at, it's a pretty easy one. It's one that we've seen before, but now we're going to look at it in a little bit more depth. And this is called hydrogenation. Anyone guess what I'm going to do? Add what? Add hydrogens, right? So the idea with hyd uh, hydrogenation is where we reduce that double bond that we have in the presence of hydrogen with some sort of metal, platinum, palladium, nickel. Those all work. Sometimes you'll actually see palladium on carbon where they actually will coat um, the activated carbon with palladium. That's a very typical way to do it. All right? And we will add two hydrogens in a syn fashion. All right? Again, think of it almost like that staple, plugging in on the same sides for it. All right. So what happens? Well, on the surface of whatever metal you're using, anyone care which metal we use today? Platinum? I'm feeling rich. Platinum. What? Oh. Yes, platinum is very expensive. So is palladium, actually. The hydrogens actually will attach kind of the surface of our metal. All right. Then our double bond, I did not give myself enough room here, will come down and coordinate to the metal as well. So this isn't like a normal sigma bond. It's more of a coordination bond. So it's just coordinated there, basically being held on. All right. And our hydrogen can add in, and then this can form a full bond down to it. And then another hydrogen can add into the other side. All right. So it adds it on on the same side. So if you think about it, it's got to come down into physical contact with that metal. So the hydrogens can only get in from one direction. So that's why we get the syn addition. which means that everything we saw about the last sin addition we have to think about for this one. So 
So for example, what if I had something like this? How many products do I get? Two, yes. However, let's think about this real quick. So we get the sin addition, right? Which means that we've got to pop these two methyl groups on the same side. My hydrogen's on the same side. What's the uh, thing about this particular one? These two are the same, right? So in this case, you would only have to put the one product because it does work out to be the same. Why? We have that plane of symmetry through the middle, right? So that means that these would be the same. However, What if I had this? I have to get both of those, right? Where it comes from the top face and the bottom face. What's the relationship with those? Diastereomers. All right, so you need to be careful again about which one you're looking at because it does add in that sin addition. Now, for those of you that want to know how this reaction works, a lot of times we actually use balloons. So yes, we have balloons in lab. And uh, you basically will fill it up with hydrogen. You'll put your palladium on carbon in there is what we use most of the time. You flush it a few times by sticking a little needle at the end. Basically, we take, have we used syringes in lab yet? I forgot if we didn't use, we haven't used them this semester because we'll use them next semester. You basically cut the top of a syringe, put the balloon on, wrap it with a rubber band, fill it with hydrogen, put the needle on, stick it through a septum, let it flush a couple times, and then stick it on and just let it go. You do need to be a little careful, though. We had an incident in our lab where um, someone was using palladium black, pretty much straight palladium. It got a tiny bit on her needle. She went to refill it uh, in our helium tank. It's not helium, hydrogen tank. And there was enough oxygen in, um, in there that it actually catalyzed the spark and basically turned it into a blowtorch. Um, Nothing like a big, tall tank of hydrogen just, you know, with a low, low torch about this big coming out of it. So you do sometimes need to be careful when doing that, though that's normally not the case. Another thing is sometimes you will use high pressure and temperatures. So if you do see that on a problem, that's fine. Sometimes high pressure and high temperature help catalyze it to go faster. All right. So any questions on hydrogenation? All right, well, we'll talk about one more thing. I think we have time for that. And that is the reaction of carbenes. So you remember back in, what was it, chapter three, I said, hey, carbenes are a thing. We won't really worry about them until later. It's later. All right, what's a carbene? You guys are on video here, come on. Like a C double bond C. Not quite a C double bond C. That's an alkene. Yes? 
Ah, uh, yes. Our carbene, remember, is CH2 with two pairs of electrons. Remember, it has a free p orbital and an orbital with a minus charge. Carbenes love alkenes. All right, so here's what happens. That carbon, right? Remember, it's sp what hybridized? What's hybridization? sp2, which means there's a free p orbital. And that p orbital is empty. If it's empty, what does it want? Electrons. What can give it electrons? The double bond. So this can feed into the p orbital. What's forming? Carbocation. What can feed into the carbocation? The pair of electrons from, now remember, that's in one of the sp2 orbitals, can feed into it. What do I make? Aha, cyclopropane. Very good. And this will also add sin, right? Because think about it, you're not going to be able to twist the three-membered ring around to be trans. So this will have to add in a sin fashion, basically being on one side. In this case, it won't matter because it's the same molecule, right? We have a plane of symmetry. OK, how do we generate our carbenes? There's a couple ways we can do it, all right? The first is using diazomethane. Now we can draw this in equilibrium. Not in equilibrium, I'm sorry. Resonance. Right, where if this pair of electrons goes here, this one can go into the carbon. What does this look like? What? Not an close. Not an nitrile. Just nitrogen gas, right? Nitrogen gas is N2, which means this is an incredibly good leaving group because nitrogen gas is very stable. So this will leave and pop off. To give us our carbene. Plus nitrogen gas that will bubble away. So we can use diazomethane as one of the methods to do that. Another method is to use some sort of haloform. Okay. A haloform is just a carbon with three of the same halogens on it. You might know chloroform. Chloroform is this with the three X's with chlorines. Iodoform would have all three with I's, with iodines, and bromoform has all three with bromines. All right. We can react this with sodium hydroxide, and essentially what happens, uh, here, let me draw it down here. on the screen. Wonderful. We'll act as a base. It picks up that proton. That can drop a pair of electrons in and kick one of the halogens off at the same time. It's essentially doing an elimination on one carbon. The one thing to remember here, though, is that you have X2, right? which means that on your product, you will have the halogens. 
on the point of your cyclopropane ring. All right, so here, let's look at an example. Uh, let's use a five-membered ring. Why not? All right, if I did this, I'm essentially, again, I'm going to generate my carbene. Remember, there's a Br2. And the halogens do help stabilize those electrons, right? They're very electronegative, so they're helping stabilize that, that lone pair. This adds in, this adds in. And I still have my bromines on the end, okay? So when you have the halo form reaction, you still end up with the bromines there. Now, diazomethane is really kind of dangerous. It will explode. You can't actually use ground, ground glass joints. So you know all the glassware we have in the lab. You can't use it. Because if the diazomethane gets into that joint and you open it, it will send glass shattering everywhere into you, which you don't want. So we only use that under very rare circumstances. It works really well, but we tend not to use it on very large quantities. All right? Using bromines or using a halo form, you end up with the halogens there. So if there is a way to do this reaction that we could just make our normal cyclopropane ring, but in a manageable way that doesn't, you know, cause imminent danger to those doing it, it's a good thing. And we actually have a reagent to do that for us. All right? And it's called the Simmons-Smith reagent. And you can either make the Simmons-Smith reagent or buy it. I should say, this can still be a little hazardous to use, but it's not as hazardous as diazomethane. All right? It comes in a really interesting canister, and it fumes. If you're not careful, it could catch on fire. So you do need to be careful with it. You're not using it, don't worry. And you make it by adding a zinc cuprate alloy. And you make the Simmons-Smith reagent. This is known as a carbonoid. It's basically like a masked carbene. And it re reacts just the same. All right. Now, you might say, where would we use this? Well, there's a lot of natural products that actually have some cyclopropane rings on them. Um, a lot of things like fatty acids that will have a cyclopropane near the end or in the middle of the tail that are used for various things. Um, there's a lot of study for various kinds of medicinal purposes and things like that. So this is a good thing to know how to do so that you can convert the alkene into a cyclopropane ring. So an example would be, let's say I had a fatty acid. In this case, we'll go with a cis fatty acid. All right. If we use the Simmons-Smith reagent, sometimes you'll see it written as the actual reagent. Other times, it'll just be written as Simmons-Smith. You'll see it just say Simmons-Smith above it. This will add the cyclopropane ring. What kind of configuration do I have right here, cis or trans? Cis. So what kind of configuration will I have to have at the end? Cis. That is correct. So when I add my cyclopropane ring, it will be in the cis and not the trans conformation. Because again, it adds in that sin addition. Right. 
Any questions about this? All right, when we come back, we're going to talk about epoxidations and then look at how do we break double bonds and oxidatively cleave them. All right, see you guys Wednesday. Some of you guys have lab today, don't forget. It's a quick lab, though, so, you know, happy day. And then lab cleanup. See you all later. <laughs>